There was, there was, but yet there was not. Once there was a boy, and this boy's favorite thing in the world was to sit at the fire with all the old men of the village. From the moment that fire was first lit until the last embers slowly fell asleep in their soft black blankets of soot, he would sit there as, one by one, each man told the story. Now, one night, as the man on one side of him finished and before the man on the other side could begin, the oldest man in the village turned from him and said, now it's your turn to tell a story. The boy was shocked and said the first thing that came to his mind, I can't tell a story. That's your job. It's everybody's job to tell stories. Otherwise, who's going to tell them when I'm gone? But I don't know how to start. Well, that's easy, said the man, for all stories start the same way. There was, there was, but yet there was not. Which means that what we're about to say is true, and true, but then again might not be true. Or, or perhaps it means that what's true for one man or two men is not true for three. But begin. Well, I'll try, said the boy. There was, there was. Oh, I can't tell a story. I can't even read. Then one day, he was sitting there, and he grinned his little grin. And he thought, <laughs> I have an idea. So he got up really fast, and he ran down the hill all the way to the village, yelling, Wolf! Wolf! There's a wolf crashing after my sheep! And the villagers, they jumped up, and they grabbed their knives and their pitchforks and their torches. And they ran up that hill, looking for that wolf. They looked under the tree, and across the river, and over the hill. And they didn't see a wolf anywhere. All they saw was Sam. <laughs> so they said, boy, what are you doing grinning over there? And he just laughed. And then they went back, shaking their heads. And Sam said, well, that was more fun than I had in a very long time. And then, without his cow, without his beloved wife, without anything to lose, he stood out on the highest hill he could find, wrapped in the cow skin and staring up at the skies that he knew his beloved had created. And then he crouched down, one, two, three, and jumped over the clouds and over the moon and into the stars and down onto the plains of heaven where he could see in the distance a beautiful castle and most importantly his wife trying to escape through one of the windows of that castle. <laughs> she saw him too, and they started running towards each other, calling each other's name, the whole romance movie shebang. <laughs> Unfortunately, guess who else saw them? That's right, the Empress. And she was really not happy. Not only had this coward taken away your daughter and gotten her to start shirking her chores and gotten her to start having delusions of actually living apart from her parents, <laughs> But now, he had actually trespassed on her land, dressed in a bloody cow suit of all things. <laughs> oh, this is not something that she was going to let happen. My darling, I am to go on a journey to inquire about one of my vineyards. Alas, I would love to take you with me, but seeing as I have no servants, I need someone to stay here and look after the castle. Here are all my keys to all the rooms in the castle. You may use these keys to explore the castle and busy yourself while I am away. But there is one room which you must not enter. This key, this key here, you must not use this key to enter my prized wine cellar. I wouldn't want you to disturb the air. The fermentation process must be perfect. Do you understand? And with that, they embraced and he left. And so many days had passed, and the wife had explored all the rooms in the castle, except the one. And well, of course, curiosity got the better of her. So she went down to that cellar, and she took that key. Oh, it's so dark in here. I don't even think I can see. Wham! And the door slammed right behind her. And she jumped, and she dropped that little key. He finds the same spot, casts his pole out, and he catches the fish again. He gets the fish out of the water, and he starts to talk, and it says, Please spare me. The man says, okay, fish, I'll spare you, but I want something in return. Me and my wife work hard, 
all week and we want to have nice things like normal people. And the fish says, go home and take the biggest fish you've caught. Inside the body you'll find a silver chain attached to the heart. You must wear this chain around your neck for as long as you live. <clears throat> Bury the fish and in the morning check the hollow of the oak tree. The man says, okay. And he throws the fish back in the water. And as it swims away, it leaves a long trail of blood in its way. So the man goes home and does what he was told. And he opens his fish up. And there's a silver chain attached to the heart. But there's something strange about the heart. It's hard like a stone. And when he holds it up to the light, it glimmers like a ruby. Well, he puts it around his neck, buries the fish, and the next day he checks in the oak tree and he feels something. He pulls it out and it's a leather pouch. And when he opens it up, it's full of gold coins. Now, a little later on, about lunchtime, and a baker came to the bridge and he had this sack full of breads and cookies and cakes. And he was taking them home to his family to um, have for lunch. And so he comes to that bridge and he sees that pig. And he says, oh, there's a pig on the side of the road. He might try to eat all of my delicious food. And well, well, I'll go ahead. Maybe he won't even notice me. So he takes, oh, he starts walking across the bridge. He gets a little closer to that pig and he says, <coughs> Yeah, here I am. <laughs> just minding my own business. Just sitting here looking up at the sky, just waiting for sack time. <laughs> and he grabs that sack and he stuffs all the bread and cookies in his mouth. And then you know what that pig did. He burped. <laughs> oh, what a pig. Oh, well, thank you, says the pig. After a couple of hours, they came to a clearing in the woods where they saw this beautiful stone house. But all around it were these ferocious looking beasts. Wolves and lions and tigers and leopards with long claws looking like they were ready to pounce. All of a sudden one jumped at them and they saw their lives flash before their eyes. They were struck with terror. But instead of being ripped apart and eaten, that leopard, he just nuzzled up against their leg and started to purr like a house cat. Now, anybody else would have thought, this probably signals that something's amiss. But <laughs> those men, they were distracted. Because one of the windows in the house was open, and they could hear this woman's voice. She was singing sweetly and softly, and they were immediately enamored with her, and they were drawn towards the house. They wanted to see if this woman was as wonderful as her voice. They walked past those animals, and they walked up to the door, and they were greeted by a tall and elegant woman with jet black hair, with beautiful gold ribbons dangling from it. She was stunning. She said to them, please come in. I can see that you are weary from your travels and my maids and I would be glad to serve you. And the men were so enamored with this woman and so thirsty that they readily accepted this invitation with no suspicion at all about her generosity. <laughs> all the animals on land, Rabbit was the most clever. One hot sunny day, Rabbit sat at the top of a great hill. To his right, he spied a large buffalo lazily chomping at the grass. On the other side of the hill, to his left, lay another buffalo, resting her feet under the thick July sun. An idea came to Rabbit, and he hopped down the hill to inquire something of the first buffalo. You sure eat a lot of grass, buffalo. Well, Rabbit, that is because I am big. Big you are, said Rabbit, but are you also strong? You don't think I'm strong? Well, not as strong as me. Why, I bet I could take you in a game of tug-of-war half asleep. It'll be a quick game, Rabbit. So, with that, Rabbit hopped back up the hill, then back down the other side, whereupon he found the other buffalo and convinced her of the same deal. So instead, I poured myself another glass of wine and decided to go over to the window to see if perhaps they were coming back. 
was no sign of them, but I stayed by the window for a few minutes waiting for them to return. And as I was there, I just happened to glance down at the chickens, and that's when I saw it. One of the wings of the chickens was burning. I'm Gretel, quite arguably the best cook that ever lived. I cannot serve a chicken with a burnt wing. So I did what I had to do. I ate that wing. <laughs> then I ate the other wing because a wingless bird made more sense to me than a one-winged bird. <laughs> Both of the wings were delicious. Again, I just wanted to keep eating, but I knew that I couldn't. So after I poured myself another glass of wine, I returned to the window because surely they must be coming back soon. It had been quite a while. But one day they were at the bar having a premium green belt beer. <laughs> and uh, a, a nice blonde elbows uh, uh, Oli in the, in the shoulder there and says, hey, tell me about your friend there. Is he single? And he says, who's Sven? Oh yeah, he's real single. <laughs> no, no, that big hipster over there. And that's like, <laughs> yeah. And he says, oh yeah, Paul, yeah, no, he's single too. <laughs> couple dates and you know it was nothing too serious but Lena's friends were awfully curious about this big fella that she was seeing so they started asking her you know Lena tell us a little bit about him and she said well I don't know about you Catholic girls but us Lutherans we do not gossip so a long time ago before all the answers to all the questions were contained in the internet <laughs> all the wisdom and knowledge in the world was contained in a pot in a clay pot and the pot belonged to the Sky King. And he kept all the wisdom in there. Now, the, the Sky King had a son, Anansi. And Anansi loved to look in the pot to see what he could find in there. It always enamored him. He could find out tomato, fruit, vegetable. <laughs> the answer was there. So he asked his father, could I have the pot of wisdom? Because Anansi, he really loved the idea of wisdom, but he was also kind of selfish. He'd like to just possess all the wisdom as well. I know you want riches, I know you want comforts, a blueberry sang so sweet. All these will come to you if you'll do as I tell you. Get up when you wake your sleep, and go where the river's most deep, and wait on the bridge for three days. Fortune will come your way. In the morning, the man walked away from his cottage under the old apple tree. He walked to the river and stood on the bridge there to see what he could see. The man watched the people come crossing the bridge and so that's why he stood on the way. And they said, you'd have to be crazy to stand on this bridge for three days. But still on the bridge he did stay, while the people went by with their errands and business and hustled and bustled all day. 